Welcome to the tool for preclinical development, creating a target product profile, and effectively engaging regulatory entities webinar. My name is Chad Jackson, and I'm the director of the Preclinical Translational Research Program at the Foundation Fighting Blindness. For nearly a half a century, the foundation has been focused on driving the research that will lead to prevention, treatments, and vision restoration for the spectrum of degenerative retinal diseases. It is our pleasure to partner with Odelia Therapeutics to add another brick on this path to progress. Before I, think, before I turn things over to Dr. Ashley Winslow, the Chief Science Officer at Odelia Therapeutics and our moderator of this session, I would like to review some logistical details for this session. Currently, all participant lines are in listen-only mode. To ask questions, you can use the Q&A feature on the Zoom control bar to, at the bottom to type in your question. If you would like to make a comment to the participants and panelists during the event, please type your comment in the chat box. This will go a long way in helping us organize the discussion. Also, today's session is being recorded and will be available for viewing at a later time on the Foundation's YouTube page. With that said, it is time for our main event, and Dr. Winslow, you have the virtual floor. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Chad, for the introduction. I want to welcome everyone to our first webinar series. If you're interested in joining us for future webinars, please uh, follow our feed. Uh, that would be both Odelia Therapeutics and Foundation Finding Blindness for updates on our next scheduled seminar. We hope it will be in November. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to briefly introduce myself and Odelia. Um, my name is Ashley Winslow, CSO for Odelia Therapeutics. For those of you who don't know us, we are a nonprofit biotech with the mission of accelerating therapeutic development for rare disease. We partner with rare disease groups, uh, patient groups, academic researchers, biotech, and pharma. Um, so if you'd like to learn more, please visit us at odelia.org. We're also on LinkedIn and Twitter. And without further ado, uh, let's get started. So with our first webinar, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Steve Brenner. Um, he will be followed by Suzanne Thornton-Jones, our second speaker. Each uh, speaker will be giving a 25 to 30 minute discussion. Um, usually th these are going to be PowerPoint format actually for all of our webinar series. So it'll be a very similar uh, series kind of pattern for our future webinars. Uh, Steve's going to start us off talking about developing a TPP and what that looks like and why, how, when to start that process. We're going to have a few minutes for questions for Steve. So please feel free to send those questions over the Q&A portion of Zoom. And then uh, Suzanne will start with her uh, session on regulatory engagement, followed by a brief question and answer session with Suzanne, and then we'll move into a panel discussion with both Steve, Suzanne, as well as Chad. So with that, Steve, if you want to go ahead and launch your slides so they can be shared with the group. Oh, one thing real quick, Steve, I was going to introduce you. I'm jumping ahead of myself. Uh, so just a brief comment about Steve and his background. So Steve Brenner is a consultant with more than 40 years of experience in the academic government and industry sectors, applying innovative chemical and protein technology to drug discovery. He spent a decade at the NIH before moving to industry. Dr. Brenner is a former, former VP of chemical and protein technologies at Bristol-Myers Squibb and the former senior director of physical sciences at DuPont. Steve is currently a member of the therapeutics development team at the Harrington Discovery Institute. So with that, Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, let me make sure I'm unmuted. Everyone can hear? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today to talk about a topic that's a bit strange for somebody who has discovery in the name of his business and discovery in the name of the institute he works with and has been in discovery for his whole career since the target product profile is sort of at the end. Uh, but I want to talk to you about how using the target project profile much earlier than people have in the past can really help people in early discovery and uh, preclinical development to maximize the value of their time and their money. So I'll go to my next slide. So what is a target product profile? Well, it's just what you think it is. It says, if I'm going to make a product, 
what's it going to look like? And it's basically a summary of the objectives of the drug development program. One way to think of it is as a draft launch label. And in many ways, it contains a lot of the elements of the labeling that you're going to do on the product, in this case, a drug, uh, at the end game. Uh, typically, it's prepared not by one individual, but multiple people in multiple disciplines from discovery, development, and marketing uh, so that you don't end up with a product that your marketing department tells you they don't think they can sell. Uh, it's a living document which matures as you learn more about the project you're working on and as you learn more about the environment you're working in. So let's talk a little bit about why is it valuable and we'll go back to this quote from Alice in Wonderland that appeared in politics recently. Um, if you don't know where you want to go, then it doesn't matter which path you take. Now you can go back and check. I've spent some time on this. Was it the Mad Hatter or was it the Cheshire Cat? And uh, we'll, we'll, maybe we should do a Zoom question on that one. But in any case, it tells you, TPP tells you where you want to go. And if you don't know where you want to go when you start, you may take the wrong road. So this is a way to kind of continually monitor whether you're on the path you need to get to the product you want. It's typically thought of as a development document, but what I've learned in the last few years is it's extremely valuable in streamlining and focusing the discovery process. And I might interject here that a, a lot of my time over the last decade or so is spent at the interface between academia and industry. Uh, that interface uh, has at it something that we uh, call the translational valley of death, which is where the great ideas of academia have a very tough time crossing that translational valley of death into the more product focused environment of drug development and drug marketing. So one of the things that TPP can help you do is build a better bridge across that valley. And you'll see that as we go along. Okay, move my next slide. What are the key elements of a target project profile? Well, this is a list of, in its simplest, one of its simplest forms. You can make it easier if you want to when you start. Um, what, what disease are you going after? What patient population? What's the molecular target of your product? Uh, what's its mechanism of action? Uh, is it an enzyme inhibitor? Uh, is it uh, an antagonist of some other biological target? Um, and if it's a particular indication with a particular patient population, what are the other existing therapies and what's your advantage over those existing therapies? Um, what's the root of administration? That may be um, a particularly important thing, say if you've got a cancer drug and you think you can make it oral versus an IV infusion, which avoids going to the uh, infusion room every three weeks or five weeks or four weeks. Uh, how, how are you gonna dose it? Uh, how frequently? Um, what are the contraindications which would make this a, an unsafe drug, for example? Warnings and precautions. Uh, what properties of the actual drug substance, uh, whether it be um, a biologic or a small molecule or an antibody? What are the pharmaceutical properties in terms of how it behaves? And we'll talk about more of that later. And how do you expect to get it approved by the FDA if you're in the US? Uh, what financially for those places that are not not-for-profits, what financially is the commercial opportunity? Uh, and what we're seeing in the business is, is really fascinating, and that is a lot of diseases for which the opportunity seems small. Uh, it, a, lot of those, a lot of those rare diseases, for example, are becoming uh, extremely attractive, and many pharmaceutical companies are now getting into rare diseases because of the a rapid path to approval in many cases, even though the patient populations are small. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. Other things might be in a T TPP, product design and formulation. It's purity, how you store it, how long it lasts, how you're gonna deliver it. When do you hope to submit it to the regulatory agency? Uh, what's the regulatory approval path? And what's the launch strategy? What's the market size? What are the projected costs to do all the submissions? And, and uh, Suzanne will talk more about that later. Um, and, and getting it approved and launched. And what's the actual cost of goods? And how do you hope to price the product? So 
what an obvious question is, is the FDA require TTP? And the answer to that is no. They don't require it, but they encourage it. They encourage it enough that they have a very nice draft, doc, a very nice document called Guidance for Industry and Review Staff on the Target Product Profile. I recommend you pull it off the internet and look at it if you want to work in this space. It, they provide a template for what a TPP should look like. Uh, and the same templates used for drugs and biologics, and I think with some minor modification even for devices. In this document, there are some interesting examples of where having a TTP actually aided an applicant in the review process, and a few examples of when a lack of a TPP was detrimental. So it's, it's uh, maybe a little dry reading, but it's a very informative reading. So you don't need one, but as I'll tell you later, I think it's, it's really valuable to have one. Now, if you're in early drug discovery, why are you worrying about a TPP? Basically because I think it allows creation of additional what I call target profiles that are directly aligned with the target product itself and its profile. So for example, if you're in small molecule space, which I'll use, use a lot in this talk, we usually now have a target hit profile. It says if you run a, a, a high throughput screen or a phenotypic screen, uh, what is the profile of a hit that is an acceptable one that warrants further study, application of additional resources and investment? Um, then as you're developing that hit, you develop hits into what are called leads. And we then have another checkpoint where we have a target lead profile. That is, you have compounds that you think are good enough that you can select them to optimize to what we call a clinical candidate. And then finally, something that we've always had in the industry is a target candidate profile. That's the point at which the uh, discovery organization makes a handoff uh, typically to the early development organization and the development organization to begin pre-IND studies and to create the data that's going to allow filing of an IND. This means all the way along the process from the day you begin your, your research program, you can be thinking about the end game and you can be making sure that the experiments you're doing in the lab are focused on the path that's going to get you there most efficiently and effectively. So if you have a discovery project plan aligned with a target product profile, that enables you to have an aligned stage, what I call stage gate or a go no go criteria all along the path. You can say, if I reach this point and I haven't got the following, uh, my lead doesn't make it to a candidate because I can't fit the criteria. You don't change the criteria. You either decide you're not going to do the project or you go back and look for a better lead that you can optimize. Generally, where you get in trouble in this business is with the fact that in the case of small molecules, the compound has a wart from the day you make it and you then try and align your strategy with the wart rather than going back and finding something that doesn't have it. Okay, we won't talk about this too much, but it's useful to look through because I wanted to explain to you why doing this efficiently and effectively is so important. The first thing is, in general, it's a long, expensive process to build, to make at least small molecule drugs that can take anywhere from 12 to 15 years before getting FTA approval. Um, the investments up front are millions of dollars just to get through the discovery phase. But when you go between that blue part of the line and the green part and start to get into clinical trials is where there's exponential growth in the amount of money you're spending because you're spending money on clinical trials, which involves hospitals, patients, CROs, and it can add up at the end for an approved drug to well over a billion or $2 billion. The number changes every couple of years, but usually to get a, small molecule drug out the door at the opposite end, a company is investing that much money in the billions. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And I just want to point out on the left of this slide, which is the probability of getting to a launch of a drug, something that goes into phase one clinical trials, which Suzanne will talk more about, in different therapeutic areas. And you can see that the probability of entering a phase one clinical trial and coming out the other end with a product is as low as three, three out of 100, so 3% for nervous CNS type indications. Uh, 
to as high as perhaps 16% for what looks to me on here to be the anti-infectives box. And I think you can see why that might be the case, but the average kind of number we've talked about since I've been in the business is one in 10 compounds that gets into the clinic actually comes out as a drug. That's pretty daunting that we've been unable, despite everything we've done and the technologies we've developed, to increase the odds of getting out the other end. Different technologies have different probabilities of technical success. At the same time you're looking at technical success, you're, all, you're also looking at what's generally a highly competitive environment. So you've got to get out the other end with a better drug, preferably the best drug, for the particular indication and target you have in mind. Okay, this is just a quick uh, look at a, another timeline just to show you, I'm gonna be spending a lot of my time, the rest of my time on the left part of this. Uh, and at the, at the IND filing part is where you're gonna learn a lot from IND enabling studies and IND filings from Suzanne when I'm finished. Okay, so having a place, these arrows, where you can make decisions. You develop an assay, you run a high throughput screen, for example, you validate the hits, you provide a chemistry team to try and take that hit to a lead. Uh, in some companies, there's an extra step, the so-called pharmaceutically acceptable lead, uh, where I worked at Bristol Myers Squibb, we didn't have this step, which is one more layer of things you have to accomplish before you get to a, a lead optimized candidate that can go into IND enabling studies. So it's a long thing and everywhere along the way, there have to be go no grow criteria to avoid the company from not only spending money on something that it isn't going to work, but not having the money to spend on something else that might be better. Uh, let me skip this one because the timetable was on the other slide. This is just an example. I wanted to show you a quick example of a target hit profile, a target lead profile, and a target product profile. So you can see here, I'm not gonna go in this, you can read this later if you like, it'll be online. But basically the requirements are that one or more of the compounds with reproducible dose responsive activity against the target in a cell free or cell assays with some minimum potencies. You know what the compound is. It's not interfering in the assay. It's not got structural alerts that is toxic elements or reactive functionalities. Uh, it's stable. Uh, it, the level of activity in the measurements is consistent with the nature of the target and there's chemistry available to support the SAR studies. When you've got that, you'll have a collection of hits from the screen or something equivalent if you're doing biologics or even for gene therapy, there'd just be different criteria. Uh, this is a lead profile and I'll let you look this over later. This is for an enzyme inhibitor. You now start to have a detailed list of criteria with the values that you need in order to move forward. Everything from molecular weight, to stability in microsomes, which, which involves the issue of metabolism of the compound, to, uh, if I go to the next slide, to things like solubility, whether it's permeable, permeable to membranes, whether it's stable in plasma. Uh, all of these criteria are things you can write down at the beginning. You know what the best criteria are, you know what acceptable criteria, and for something you can look at, you can see do, how many are green, how many are yellow, and how many are red, which means they don't meet the optimal or acceptable criteria. We try and put these things together very early in a project so that we have a focus on what we're looking to get to. For a candidate profile, again, we're looking for much higher potency in general, typically less than 10 nanomolar. It's selective against other targets. For example, if it's a kinase inhibitor, it doesn't hit any of the hundreds of kinases with, uh, with a potency that's uh, less than a hundred fold the potency of the target you're interested in. Uh, it actually gets into the body and it's got pharmacokinetics and maybe once daily dosing in humans at a doses of 250 milligrams or less. This is for a CNS target. Uh, you prefer once daily dosing and you hope that you don't have to give a lot. And it, if, it's, if, it, if it's going to be given orally, you have to have data about oral bioavailability in dogs and monkeys. You can look at all the rest of these, but these are the kind of check, check marks you have to put on the project to say I've got a candidate, a target candidate. Here's another example for a kinase inhibitor. 
uh, it's, it's a highly potent kinase inhibitor. Uh, it's suitable for use in combination, in this case, with anti-SARS-CoV therapeutics, for those working on CARS-CoV projects, SARS-CoV products. Um, and, and you can read the other criteria, but again, for each, each kind of target, you'll have a list of acceptable criteria for the target product profile. Uh, so, creation of a target product profile engages the organization in creating a really project, valuable project management tool that facilitates interaction with regulatory agencies, it enables you to create the upstream project plan with stage gate decision points that are aligning research decisions with the eventual product label. It ensures alignment of the organization on the disease indication, the target population, the acceptable and optimal routes of delivery. It also assists when you have it done well in proactively managing budgets, headcount, and resource planning in general. It's an evergreen document that should be updated as there are changes in the competitive environment that impact likely available patients for clinical trials. For example, if you wanna do a patient trial in uh, coronavirus patients, are there sufficient patients in the sufficient demographic groups and age groups that you need, or are they all tied up in other clinical trials? And again, for eventual therapy as well as product pricing. So I'll stop there. Uh, looks like I've made it under my 25 minutes. I'd be happy to take questions. Great, thanks, Steve. Uh, so while we're collecting a few questions in the Q&A portion of Zoom, so remember we have a chat portion. If you have any issues or comments, please focus on the chat section. For the Q&A, please post your questions in that section and we'll um, feed those to the speakers. Uh, while we're collecting those questions, uh, we would like to launch a poll real quick. We'll have a few of these throughout the sessions just to collect a little bit more information about the audience. Uh, so let's go ahead and launch the first one, which just asks about your role in drug development. All right, and while we're waiting for those to come in, Steve, let's go ahead and start with the first question. So the first question is, is the potency of a 10 micromolar cutoff true for peptides as well as small molecules? Okay. Steve, are you there? You got, got it. Go yeah. ahead. <laughs> I think it, it varies again. Uh, the, the potency cutoff may not be 10 micromolar. It depends on the project. It depends on the target. Um, I think the likelihood of it being the same for peptides, in my experience, is, is no, it probably isn't. Um, it, again, peptide therapeutics have their own particular interesting set of problems, uh, but they've become a hotter commodity lately as people are learning how to deliver them well. I don't know that... Uh, in any I've worked on, I can remember something quite that high as a cutoff. Usually your initial peptides are much more potent than that, simply because you've got a lot more elements in the molecule that can bind to the target. If that Great. helps. Great. Uh, the second question we have is, where can one access acceptable profiles for uh, ocular drugs, including gene therapy? So. Do you know of example TPPs for either ocular programs or gene therapy programs or a combination thereof? Uh, I don't know of a compendium of them. I happen to be working with a scholar uh, and we put one together for a program that's a retinal degeneration program. Uh, and I think you'd find it would be easy to do, uh, relatively easy to do. Uh, it may be that uh, that Ashley or Chad may have a better source. Uh, or in fact, um, Suzanne. Yeah, I was gonna suggest Suzanne, maybe you have a few examples yeah. or resources. So where we start typically is go to, if there are any ophthalmologic or similar products approved, is look at their label, right? Because that will help you see where, how they got approved and then you can springboard off of that if you need to be better, what do I need to be better in? Is it potency? Is it safety? You know, uh, is it efficacy, right? And so if there's something approved, that's where I would start. Um, if not, then I, I think you try to draw from other approvals of a similar class and, and start from there. Of course, what's going to inform it is your data because every project must stand on their own, but you can learn from those that perhaps have already been approved. 
that's how I, that's where we start is, is there something already approved? Let's go look at the label and let's see what they did. And I think it's worth noting, we, we are recording these sessions and we're gonna make those available afterwards um, for review. And one thing that Odelia and FFB can think about is maybe making some resources and links available that go along with these topics. So um, the, I think that's a, a great suggestion. Just where do you find these things? We can, we can include guidance maybe, um, as well as other examples. Uh, so we'll look to identify those and update the links to help you guys find what you need. Okay. All right. Last so question. next question, who should be involved in generating the TPP, Steve? That's a really good question. And, and if, you, if you talk to some of the academic scientists I've worked with on the first day you meet them and ask if they have a target product profile, you're not gonna get off to a very good start. Um, my experience is it really helps to know who in your environment has any experience at the at the farther ends towards a product who can help you with that. Um, I think there are some academic centers where there's enough drug discovery going on, uh, and I think Suzanne's is a wonderful example, where the scholars wouldn't at all be concerned about being asked that question because they live in an, art, uh, an environment where they have people like Suzanne around to help them take their projects from bench to bedside. So um, if you don't have that, and you're, for example, an academic working at a smaller university that doesn't have a lot of people that have, I would try and find people, um, either, either consulting firms who could provide you with advice, hopefully for free, uh, or um, companies nearby that might be interested in the kind of research you're doing that could, you could talk to about what they feel would be needed for that project. Again, what Suzanne said, if you think you understand what your, what your science is going to lead you to in terms of a product, go out and find products like that and look at the label because in some senses that'll tell you. Yeah. Um, actually, can I jump in real quick? I did want to mention that also you can re reach out to foundations or organizations such as the Foundation Fighting Blindness or Odelia Therapeutics to also tap into our robust networks that, um, and our clinician scientists that work in that realm. So often that we have people um, that we work with all the time that understand the landscape of how a, a therapy should actually look when you're talking about treating patients. So foundations are a great place and also um, companies like, um, or, or organizations such as Lobelia who are also working in that space. Yeah, that's a great point, Chad. I was going to mention that as well, that I, I think the, the co-hosts currently, we are, one of the reasons we're putting on these webinars is to help disseminate and share this information and tap into experts in the field. Um, but it's also something that we can help you with, or at least uh, help identify the right person and resources. Um, with that, real quick, Madison, would you like to share our, the results of our poll? So I think these should appear for everybody on your screen. Hopefully you can see those. Uh, a lot of folks from a lot of folks from academia and as well as biotech and pharma, but also patient groups, investment group, non-patient funding groups, and other. All right, thanks everyone for participating. Um, why don't we go ahead and launch the next poll, which I think has to do with TPP. Have you ever prepared? Oh, I can't. Have you ever prepared or utilized a target product profile? All right, we'll go back to those results in just a minute. Steve, I have, uh, since we have a little bit of time still, I have a question for you. When is the appropriate time to start drafting the TPP? Is there a certain trigger, really? Is there, is there a certain way to think about, you know, what's, what's too early or what's too late? Where do you really want to aim to start that process? Yeah, I, over the last five years of working with the Harrington Discovery Institute, I've changed my view on that a lot. Um, let me just give a quick plug for Harrington, only because what Harrington provides are grants to academics, uh, MDs, MD, PhDs uh, for two years or so. And the funds are great, but they're not huge. But what you do get is access to our uh, therapeutic development team. People like me who've had a lot of industry experience all the way from early discovery through structure-based drug design into clinical trials, 
uh, IND filings, uh, competitive intelligence gathering. And that scholar who thinks he's getting some money is actually getting that team. Uh, and what happens there is when you want help with how do you draft a TPP, the people are right there to help you. And so that's a great way for a project that you think has potential impact uh, to get the kind of um, start it needs uh, in getting towards a real product. I would, I would just ask you to look out for calls every year from uh, FFB was one of the sponsors at Harrington. Uh, the Alzheimer's Disease Foundation also provides funds. And then there are a bunch of grants called Scholar Innovator Grants uh, that are um, funded by Harrington. Uh, and you can apply for those uh, and see what happens. There's a call every year for Scholar Innovator Grants and from some of the others. That, so where did, I get, where did I end up? I ended up thinking that early on, on our first meeting with the scholars, we talk about, have you defined your disease indication? Do you know the patients you want to treat? And have you thought about what your product will look like? And we try within the first few months of that two-year grant to have a target product profile uh, and some of the other profiles put together, helping the scholar along the way. Usually that ends up, we think, streamlining the process to get out the door. Great, and just real quick, is there a website for Harrington that you can yes. direct folks to? Yes, uh, I can give you the link later and you can send it out, but I think it's just harringtondiscovery.org. If not, uh, look up the Harrington Discovery group on Google and you'll find the links. Perfect. Thanks, Steve. Um, Madison, why don't you go ahead and open up that, the poll results for everyone to look at. So majority of our participants actually have not done a TPP. Great. So hopefully this is a, a learning experience for everyone, um, but there are some folks out there who have. So, um, all right. I think our next polls aren't until Suzanne's session. So we'll hold on that. And let me see, we have a little bit more time. I think we have two more questions. Where can I find a protocol or sample protocols of preclinical studies and drug development for gene therapy to make sure all steps are, are considered? So Steve or Suzanne, um, I, I could probably, Chad and I might be able to chime in as well. Um, any answers from you guys? Steve, you're on mute. I'd suggest Suzanne give a shot because she's living in the gene therapy world. <laughs> Yeah, well, not only in the gene therapy world, but I also used to run these studies and, and worked at FDA reviewing them. Um, so generally now you can do a pretty easy Google search and find some basic protocols. Um, also the guidances provide some insight into that, but you're actually better Googling and then contacting a CRO or someone who conducts these studies and make sure that um, what you need for your product um, can be done, right? Because gene therapy has some very unique characteristics, which we'll talk about from a non-clinical perspective. Um, and you can't do a standard preclinical study uh, for gene therapy. They're usually truncated, et cetera. So maybe we'll revisit this question after my presentation. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, I would say there are also a few groups working on standardized protocols, standardized information to help uh, guide process, simplify the process, streamline the process so there's less time wasted. Something Odelia has been working on and I actually, um, my hope in, in with our webinar series, I think that was some of our initial discussions with FFB is that talking through some of the topics on the webinar would help guide that. But I do think there's also room for specific protocols to be shared and developed. So it's something that a few groups are looking into. Um, please stay tuned. So we'll take one last question on TPP. So since gene therapy has been approved in certain cases, has the TPP process for gene therapy been shortened, simplified a bit? I know who the obvious person is to answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would that be me, uh, Captain yeah. Obvious? No, just kidding. Um, so <laughs> I would say no, because a label is a label is a label. It doesn't matter whether it's a small molecule, monoclonal, or gene therapy. What does change, which I've noticed, is that in all the gene therapy approved labels, there's one section that's called the animal toxicology or pharmacology section, which is laid out in the requirements for FDA. 
for small molecules and monoclonals, that section is rarely populated. However, if you look at all the gene therapies that have been approved, they're populated with information. So that's a different shift that has been made for gene therapies because you're seeing some very different toxicities that you don't always see in small molecules. Um, so I don't think the TPP process personally should be truncated because it's the same information. You still need to know what's your indication, what's your population, how you're ministering it, what's the PK of it, which we'll talk about, um, what's your clinical trials say, how are you, uh, what's your presentation? Is it in a vial? You know, many of the gene therapies have to be frozen at minus 60, right? So there are, it's the same information regardless of what therapeutic you're developing. My two cents anyway. No, I completely agree. And I think every disease also presents a slight different profile um, and outcomes and that may be specific to that disease. Right. Now, you know, the basic thing, components of the TPP, like Steve said, go into your label. So there would be no truncating of information. It would just be slightly different presentation, perhaps. Like I said, the animal pharmacology and toxicology, inf toxicology information is rarely found in small molecules. I remember one label, which I was the non-clinical reviewer for, where we pushed to get that information in. And that was an oddity because you don't usually see that, but it was a specific toxicity um, that seemed to be related to the treatment. So we wanted to make physicians aware that this is possible, is something that you need to, to um, look out for, basically. All right. With that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Suzanne, um, although she's jumped into our conversation already. Maybe I should have done that from the beginning. Uh, so Suzanne Thornton-Jones has a PhD in pharmacology and toxicology from the Medical College of Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University. She's Chief Regulatory and Compliance Officer at the University of Pennsylvania Gene Therapy Program. Her primary responsibilities include development and implementation of the regulatory strategy for engagement of health authorities around the world throughout the clinical research process, clinical trial, and registration processes. In addition to her regulatory responsibility, she also leads the Compliance Group Good Laboratory Practice or GLP Quality Assurance Unit, which is responsible for auditing non-clinical studies used to support health authority regulatory filings. Suzanne has worked in regulatory affairs for 15 years in the pharmaceutical industry and six years as a pharmacology tox reviewer at the FDA. Um, and that's actually FDA specifically CEDAR. So with that, Suzanne, why don't you go ahead and it looks like your slides are shared. So whenever you're ready. Let me get myself off, off of mute. Uh, thank you, Ashley. So um, let's just jump right in. So Steve has shown you a number of uh, schematics about the roadmap from laboratory to market. So, you know, everyone has their favorite schematic. This is my favorite one because it, it not only talks about how you get from basic research, but it also talks about all the regulatory interactions that you could have, as well as the filing of, of your NDA or BLA. And as Steve said, the TPP is very important because even though you're starting with basic research, you have to start with the end in mind. So you're probably wondering, all right, I'm starting. I think I have a product. What do I do? When do I go for a meeting? Do I even have enough non-clinical data to have an informed conversation with a health authority? What type of meeting do I request? Did you know there are different types? How do I even request the meeting? And do I have to send anything ahead of time or can I just show up and have a conversation? And when do I know if I'm ready to submit an IND? So my job today is to try to answer or provide some insight into these questions. So step one, right? The easy step, some people say, which is probably a harder step than what people really imagine is you must start with the basic research. And as Dee said, try to identify a potential clinical candidate. This can be short time, can be a long time. It just really depends. Um, and as part of not only just finding your target, but identifying the candidate and also trying to understand what you need to do from a preclinical or non-clinical study perspective. What I'm not going to talk about today is the other aspects that need to be uh, being discussed in this early phase is the clinical trial. What would it look like? What would endpoints be? 
what endpoints could we uh, learn from the non-clinical research discovery component of this development plan that can then inform uh, the clinical trial. I'm also not going to talk about CMC issues, which you really need to pay close attention to, because you may be able to find the best product for the best indication and an unmet need, but if you can't manufacture it, you're dead in the water. So, you know, you need to also think about all of these aspects, but I'm not really going to touch on them today. So as you know, when you're looking to develop products, they call them NCEs, new chemical entities, or NMEs, new molecular entities, there are different types of products you could um, begin doing research. There are drugs and there are biologics. And the three big differences between the drug and a biologic, as you would expect, is the size. So drugs are smaller molecules versus biologics or biotherapeutics is another term used, are larger, more complex. For drugs, they're synthesized chemically for the most part. In biologics, they often involve the synthesis via a biologic system, a cell, for example. Drugs are relatively stable. Actually, in your early screening or hits, as Steve discussed, if you find a product that's not stable in the blood or in a tissue, you usually turf that to the side and don't progress because the the amount of work you have to do to make it stable may be insurmountable. For biologics, they're relatively liable. Label. They don't last very long in, the, in um, the matrices. So regardless of whether you're developing a drug or a biologic, there are certain non-clinical aspects which are really the focus of this early phase or step one of drug development that you really need to investigate. Um, and not only at the beginning, but also there are certain aspects of this that you need to examine throughout your whole development plan. So there's the pharmacology or pharmacodynamics, there's the toxicology, and there's also the pharmacokinetics. So what's the difference? Pharmacology, pretty much simply put, is what's the mechanism of action? So you have a, a molecule or a small molecule or gene therapy. Gene therapy is a little easier because you usually know what gene you want to replace or fix. But for a small molecule, where is it hitting? What, what's the receptor? Do you know the mechanism of action when you give it? Why is this important for regulators? Well, if you know the pharmacology, you can understand the rationale for your therapeutic use of the drug. Getting back to what Steve said, what's your indication? Have you hit the right target that you think you need to affect that disease? Toxicology is just basically the science of poisons or poisoning. Why would you need to examine toxicology? People don't really realize that pharmacology actually intersects with toxicology, which are the adverse effects after you give the product. Um, so say you, if you know the pharmacology and you know your target you're hitting, for some of these well-known mechanisms, you know what the potential toxicity is going to be. So you can predict some of it, although that's why you conduct toxicology studies is because it's not always predictable what's going to happen from an adverse effect uh, perspective. And then pharmacodynamics. So many people will have heard the ADME or ADME. So this is short for absorption, distribution, metabolism or biotransformation and elimination of drugs. Why do you need to know about the pharmacokinetics? Well, if you know what's happening when you give your drug, it can increase the possibility of your hit on target, therapeutic success, and also try to understand if there are gonna be any adverse effects in the body. So with these three non-clinical principles, as I call it, as you can imagine, there are many guidances that are available that help you understand what you, studies you need to conduct, the content, um, and when you need to conduct them. So I'm not gonna go through all of these, but here you'll see that as you would expect, there are different guidances for small molecules or drugs, as well as large molecules such as monoclonals and gene therapy. The big difference between a small and large molecule, um, they all need to have some type of pharmacology assessment. Um, it just depends on the species. So for a small molecule, there are generally two species, a rodent and a non-rodent. They're just normal, we call them normal healthy animals. So they're just a rat hanging out in the cage. 
Whereas when you get to monoclonals, for example, in a pharmacology study, you can't usually always use a basic rat. You need to have a species that's most sensitive to your product. And in gene therapy, forget that. We can't usually use rats, which actually uh, don't transduce very well uh, gene therapy products. We usually use a disease model. So we have to find or create a diseased animal model that recapitulates as much of the human condition or indication as possible in order to show efficacy. Uh, there are also different studies that you need to assess from a safety pharmacology perspective. So safety farm is very specific. Usually it's the heart, the lung, and the brain or CNS, but there are other ones you might want to consider. What happens if your indication already has a slow problem with GI motility? If your product slows it down even more, that can lead to different pharmacology or more important, different toxicology or adverse effects. Or if it speeds it up, maybe you're not getting any efficacy because the product's being eliminated and therefore you have nothing to, do in, to show an effect of the product. From a toxicology perspective, there are also differences mainly about species, how many do you need to use, one species or two, um, if it's acute or a single dose versus repeat dose. For uh, gene therapies, which is where I'm currently working, generally gene therapies are one and done, right? So you do a single dose, but what changes is how long do you need to follow the animals? you need to look for not only durability of effect, but toxicity as well. There are other studies, of course, that impact your TPP and your labels, so reproductive toxicology. You need to do some type of assessment on that. Usually in gene therapy right now, um, it really depends on your target patient population, and you try to uh, look into the studies that you've already done Right now it's paper exercise, but I have a feeling that might change at some point. Um, genetic toxicity or mutagenicity, pretty important for small molecules. Monoclonals, it's not really conducted because they're, they're large. The, the size of these molecules are large, so it's unlikely that it's gonna enter the nucleus and lead to mutagenicity. Gene therapy, it really depends. It depends on your vector, such as lentivirus are known to integrate so therefore there's a high possibility of mutagenicity. Carcinogenicity is pretty much the same. Um, it just depends. Small molecules, it's a standard two species right now. Um, in monoclonals gene therapy, large molecules, right now it's a paper assessment or what they call risk management plan. What are you gonna monitor in the clinical trial to uh, see if there are any cancers or tumors that show up? And then, of course, the ADME, as I discussed, is very important. Um, that includes absorption, distribution, metabolism, excretion. For monoclonals, it's, it's really important uh, to look at protein binding. And for gene therapy, really what we're looking for is tissue biodistribution. Is it getting to the tissues that you want? As you would expect with most products, highly perfused tissue is going to be highly exposed. So is it staying and going where you want? So are you hitting your target and what's happening to the tissues where it, you don't want it to go? And then the other thing that's very important for gene therapy is excretion or shedding. So shedding in the, in the urines, shedding in the feces, shedding in the blood, shedding in your CSF if it's uh, directly injected there. This has an impact on your environmental risk assessment because there's a big discussion of, well, how much exposure after you give a gene therapy, for example, is being exposed to the fish and the flora in like the septic system of patients getting gene therapy. So all of this are really set out by guidances and guidelines around the world. And this is just literally a snapshot of differences. All right. so. You've done some basic research, you have your clinical candidate, you have some type of preclinical development plan based on the guidance, such as information from the two previous slides. Are you ready? Are you ready for a pre-IND? How do I ask for it? The thing to remember as well is when you're looking at are you ready for a pre-IND is that this preclinical development, all those studies that I presented just a few minutes ago, 
you don't have to have them completed before you start a pre-IND. However, you better have a plan that you can discuss with the FDA or other health authorities of how you're going to approach or conduct these studies, but they don't all have to be completed. All right, so let's talk about pre-IND. So who knew? There are different types of formal meetings you can have with the FDA. They're actually pretty simple, ABCs. So there's a type A meeting, a type B meeting, and a type C. As you can imagine, there are differences. So the main differences are once you have a meeting request, when will you hear back from the FDA if they've granted the meeting or not? When will the meeting be held? Do you need to submit a briefing book? Yes, you do, but there's specific timing around when that briefing book needs to be received to enable that meeting to occur. So for our discussion today, we're gonna to focus on type B meetings because this is where the primary meeting types, if you remember that roadmap, um, are, just, are considered. So they're pre-IND, end of phase one, end of phase two, pre-NDA, BLA. These all fall under a type B type of meeting. Meaning from the time you send in your meeting request, which we'll talk about in a minute, FDA will notify you in 21 days whether they're going to grant that meeting or not. As well as within 60 days of your meeting request, they will have the meeting, which means that 30 days before that, you need that briefing package submitted. Now, the thing to recall is that now in COVID era, as I call it, meetings are no longer being via teleconference or video conference. They're obviously not occurring face to face. And right now, FDA has made the announcement that all meeting feedback will be WRO or written response only. What does this mean to you? For us, we have changed our approach and that we don't send a meeting request and then wait for FDA to tell us for 20 in 21 days whether we're going to get feedback or not. And then uh, quickly turn around a briefing document so that we can have the meeting in 60 days. We've changed our approach to make it look more like a type A meeting in that we submit the meeting request and the briefing document at the same time because it cuts out that 30 day window because they're just going to give us written responses only. So just a few tips and tricks that we've learned in the COVID era, as I call it. So what are the commonalities with this meetings? So as I mentioned, meeting requests. In the old days, pre-COVID, they were face-to-face. -face. They could be telecons or written response. Like I just mentioned right now, all feedback is written response only. Thing to remember is just because you get their feedback doesn't mean you're done. So if you get your written feedback from the FDA now, you still can hop on the phone, let them know, hey, we have some questions. Can we talk to you on the phone or should we provide it in writing? And then maybe have a TC. So it doesn't mean that just because you get your feedback, you're done, you never get to engage with them. So that's something to re remember. Background documents, as I mentioned, you need to provide background information. What are your questions? What is your position? Like, why are you asking the questions? Why is it important to you? Who's gonna attend the meeting would be another common one. We still in, include that, even though we're getting written responses only. Um, the other things you need to know is really lay out all your plans, both for your non-clinical, your manufacturing, and your clinical plans for your first in human you can even go as far as to project where you think you're going to be to get to approval registration. The other thing that's common are meeting minutes. So there are official meeting minutes if you actually get to meet with them that appear within 30 days of the meeting. Um, the other good thing that has happened is that before you actually have a meeting, before the COVID era, you would get their preliminary feedback within two days or so of your meeting. So you would know what their uh, feedback were for your questions. The reason that this is very helpful and is what's missing now in the COVID era is that you could then focus your meeting with them on just the questions or the feedback that you received where you need clarification or Maybe you didn't agree with their feedback because maybe they missed something very important in your briefing book and so their feedback doesn't make sense. Um, so 
you could even choose to just cancel the meeting. Maybe they're written feedback before the meeting was sufficient and now you don't need to have that meeting anymore. In the COVID era, it's a little more difficult to get them on the phone, but you, again, you still get the written feedback and there is still the opportunity to have an interaction. It's just their workload is also quite high that it's, it's actually difficult to get them on the phone, but never hurts to ask. <laughs> So when you're requesting and preparing for the meeting, um, really you have to think about what do you want to get out of the meeting. So their advice to your questions really depends on one, what is the question and two, what did you put in your briefing document to support the question. They need to have a lot of content in it. It's not something that you can put together really quickly um, you need to have enough background information that the FDA can review it and hopefully provide you at a minimal a direction um, where the way that we work our briefing documents is I'm fully transparent. Like if we don't have everything fully baked and fully understood, we still put in our thinking. What's our thought process as to how we're going to get to that answer just to see if the FDA has any guidance that they can offer us. Um, you should really make sure that you have thought about all the possibilities of answers that you could get back. Um, you really want to have this to be an interactive type of meeting. Again, it's a little more difficult than the COVID era, but I'm hoping that once this passes in the next six months to a year that we can go back to actually having this interactive conversation where it should be a think tank where you're there to help develop the products together, not separately. And the questions need to be very specific and clear and don't go overboard. Like if you have 15 to 20 questions for them, that's gonna really make them mad and you're probably gonna get answers to things that you don't want. Purpose, as I said, is to get agreement, focus on the preclinical or non-clinical, that's very important early, um, discuss, every opportunity, every product, you know, about your CMC, your clinical, et cetera. And remember, for your first in human trial, they're really looking at safety. So what non-clinical information or previous human experience are you going to have to support that program? And for time's sake, I'm going to skip over this, but here's some example questions, what we call our vanilla questions, which we then springboard off of depending upon the program. So for CMC, we generally say, hey, do you agree with the current manufacturing process, platform, release testing? That's a very big, uh, important aspect right now to support the trial. This can go any which way. You can have sub bullets. It can be even asked different ways. Some people say, we believe that our program is appropriate for phase one. Do you agree? Right? So there's no right or wrong way to ask a question. Um, the wrong way is to not ask a question for which you don't think you want the answer because um, you probably want the answer sooner than later. Non-clinical, again, gene therapy world, we're using diseased animal models. Is the animal model appropriate? Do you think our plan for the non-clinical studies is appropriate for supporting the proposed population? From a clinical perspective, you always want to make sure is the study population that we're proposing adequate? Do we have the right endpoints, efficacy, or relevant in this population? Again, gene therapy, we tend to combine our phase one and two programs. We don't have a typical phase one, phase two, phase three. So we have safety first. That's what your first in humans are about. But we also have efficacy endpoints included. So we want to know, are they right? Are they appropriate for this indication? Is the duration and timing of follow-up very important in gene therapy world and especially safety monitoring? You need to get there, you need to present to them what your safety monitoring plan is and what's gonna happen if you see a toxicity in the clinical trial. You're gonna stop it. How are you gonna determine how to restart it? So just an example of what we call our vanilla questions, which then we expand upon for the program. Do you really need a pre-IND meeting for every product? Not usually, but it's a good idea if you're developing something novel, if there's no current guidance out there, 
we have some strange study design. I remember when adaptive clinical trial designs came out, everyone wanted to talk to FDA because there are different ways to do adaptive designs and there's no right or wrong, but you probably need to have them pontificate on your plan to make sure that it will work. If you're a new sponsor in an area, it's always good to rub elbows with FDA, as they say, and get them to know who you are. Um, you know, establish that relationship. It's especially important if you have some type of signal, either in your pharmacology or toxicology, to make sure that you have um, present to them how you're going to address it, how you're going to monitor for it, if there are additional studies that you need to do on the non-clinical side. This is just some recent feedback we've had, again, in the gene therapy world. Some of these are appropriate for gene therapy. Some are really across the board. I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I've talked too long anyway, but really what's important or the feedback for the disease animal model, as I mentioned, is how close is it to your clinical indication? Does, do you even know the natural history of your diseased animal model? Does it recapitulate your human indication? And they really want a long description in your IND when you file it. Many times in our INDs, the section can be five to 10 pages because we're correlating between what the animal model did or doesn't have compared to the human and why we think it's relevant. What's really become an important issue, not just for gene therapy, but for example, in the COVID world, everyone's trying to take devices that may already be approved, but they're not approved for, say, intranasal delivery of a particular product. So really, you need, if you are using a device drug combination, you need to have this in the pre-IND um, package, and you need to present how you're going to do it, what information you have. Um, and then actually make sure that you have done something to make sure that you, this device can repeatedly deliver your product. For example, in our AAV vectors, uh, intranasal delivery is not foreseen for some of these products. So we have to do specific set of studies to make sure that one, it doesn't affect the potency or titer and that you know, we're actually getting exposure that we want. The other kicker that will always come back in your pre-IND feedback is your non-clinical study reports. They want full reports. So um, you can't just say, hey, we did the study, we threw 20 animals on, this is the data. They want study reports, full what you did, have a prospective protocol, any amendments, the results, conclusion. They want to see the raw data. You can't just say, hey, here's the summary data, be happy. That also dovetails into GLP versus non-GLP, so good laboratory practices. Pharmacology studies generally are not conducted under GLP, but as you get more and more into safety readouts, they want to have some type of oversight. They really, the epitome is to have a GLP, which we have auditors, you have SOPs, you know, everything is assessed to make sure that the study was conducted per protocol, et cetera. However, some of the uh, gene therapy programs don't have a GLP lab or you know, there's some very unique diseased animal models that can't just be done at like Charles River or another CRO. So what they're asking for is some type of oversight. It doesn't have to be full GLP, but it's something to think about. They would not reject your program if they're not, if you don't have GLP studies, but they will ask you what type of oversight did you have? And if you didn't have it, then justify why. Clinical, again, not really touching on it today, but make sure you have a clear definition of how you're going to dose escalate or dose de-escalate. Make sure you know your efficacy endpoints. Are they meaningful for your indication? And most importantly, your safety. How are you monitoring? How are you going to dose up? Where, how are you going to start your trial? How are you going to restart it? And to Steve's point, the standard boilerplate language that you get for every pre-IND is what's on this slide, TPP. Do you have it? We recommend you have it. Submit it with your pre-IND briefing book so we can see where you're going. Because if they can't see where you're going, they're only going to be able to provide you a snapshot of where you are and what you pre present in your briefing document. And a TPP also lets them know 
How are you thinking about this and where are you going? All right, so you've had your pre-IND. Are you ready to file your IND? Um, and I'm just going to, Ashley, you can cut me off. The thing is obviously is, are you ready? So what triggers that? Your non-clinical development. Have you conducted your pharmacological activity? Are you ready? The other question is, do you really need to file an IND? So the answer is mostly yes. Um, when you have a new unapproved drug product that you want to administer in humans, that's a new chemical or, or molecular entity, yes. Are you changing a product that's already approved? You're changing the route, you're changing the indication, yes. The other question is, do you really have to file an IND at phase one only? No, you can open an IND regardless of the phase. Say you've done a phase one outside of the U.S. and you're ready to start a phase two. You can bring that knowledge and experience from your other clinical trials to the U.S. and open your IND at a phase two. So what's most important that FDA is going to look at in your IND is patient safety, right? Have you done the right number and type of non-clinical studies? Have you identified appropriate toxicity? And if you have toxicity, can you monitor for it in your clinical trial? And how are you going to monitor for it? Phase two and three, that's a different story. And since we're focusing on phase one, I won't discuss that. You've ready, you think you've got it, you file your IND, now what? So, INGs nowadays are electronically submitted. They're submitted in this electronic CTD, common technical document format. They're uh, submitted through the electronic gateway. The thing is, if you're an academic, you can ask for a waiver for these electronic submissions and the FDA will work with you on a hybrid approach. Recently, we filed it on a CD, like who has CD players anymore? But we did burn it to a CD, send it to FDA, and hope they had a CD player, which they did because they loaded it into their e-gate or their e-sub, they call it at FDA. Nice. If you know the division where you're submitting it, it's nice to say, hey, I've got an IND coming. They probably won't remember it, but you've at least given some advance, advance notice. So the thing is, once FDA gets your IND, it's triaged by the division, the assigned reviewers, and the review starts. You have 30 days until they get back to you. However, during that 30 days, you're not just sitting around waiting. Well, you kind of are, but what you're waiting for are questions, or IRs, we call it, information requests. These requests can come very short order. They can come on day 28 of your day 30, and you should daggone get on those really quickly to make sure you're not on clinical hold. It could be simple questions like, we can't find this in your submission. Can you tell us where it is? They can be very detailed. Your clinical protocol has these 20 things that we don't agree with. We need an answer to this, 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 and this. And they'll give you a timeline by when they want the response. Sometimes it's 24 hours, sometimes it's a week. The 24 hour ones are the most difficult because when you're providing responses, you need to be very careful in the crafting of your answer. You don't wanna just submit jibber jabber, right? You wanna have it make sense and to make sure that it's covered all the points in the question. Thing is that many of the clinical holds in your IND can be avoided and resolved in this 30 day review. For the most part, if there are deficiencies identified, they're gonna let you know and give you a chance to resolve it. However, there may be some that you can't resolve within those 30 days. So two outcomes for your IND. One is you're allowed to proceed. Some are say it's reasonably safe. INDs are considered active. They're not approved like an NDA or BLA. And sometimes you get safe to proceed. So you'll get a, your, your IND is safe to proceed, but you'll always know where you stand at the 30 day date. Might be at 5 p.m. on the 30 day date, but you know whether you're on hold or not. And there are also different types of hold. Are you on full hold, meaning you can't do anything in your clinical trial, or maybe you're on partial hold, saying you have enough to start your first low dose patients, but you can't proceed past that until you do X, Y, Z. And of course, in the regulations, there are specific grounds for why you're on hold. So 
there you go. You submitted your IND, you get to it, you start doing your clinical trial, and then throughout this roadmap, there are obviously different opportunities that you can engage the FDA, either into phase one, into phase two, pre-VLA, et cetera. So that's your tiptoe through non-clinical, pre-IND, and IND. Ashley, back to you. All right, Suzanne, thank you. Um, if you wanted to go through any more material, we are okay on time, but we can also jump into questions. Yeah, I think questions would be good, I think. I hope, right. I don't know, I hope I have answers to them before I say that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's, um, let's go ahead and get the next poll rolling while I bring up our questions. So everyone's gonna see something pop up on their screen. If you wanna participate, that'd be helpful. In the meantime, uh, let's start with the first question. Uh, surprised to see toxicology for gene therapy only needs single species. FDA will accept a mouse model without tox studies in a larger animal. I think yes. most people are seeing the mouse format move to NHP studies, so maybe you can comment on that in more detail. Yeah, so actually, you know, most, most health authorities really don't encourage you to use large animal monkey studies, um, they will accept the disease model that has pharmacology and toxicology endpoints in it. But that's definitely something you need to negotiate up front uh, with the agency. FDA uh, really, again, they don't encourage large animal. In our program, we do do a monkey tox study. It's our preference. If you go across the pond to MHRA, the UK and EMA, they really don't like monkey studies at all and just provide um, a disease animal model with some tox endpoints and it is sufficient for them. And when you say using your disease model, are you talking about combined efficacy and tox studies or are you separating those in two separate studies? No, all one. I mean, for the most part, MEDs, right, or proof of concept studies, minimal effective doses, have some type of tox endpoints. Um, so maybe you would do more safety assessments on the histopathological assessments that you wouldn't necessarily do in an MED study. Um, you know, it just depends. So you would add more of the tox endpoints into that disease animal model. And is that true for, um, I can see that being the pattern for things that have had a path to the clinic before. If you're in the ocular subretinal space, uh, Spark has been there and maybe laid the groundwork and made that a bit easier. If you're going into a new organ system or new uh, route of delivery. Does that change that decision or planning at all? No, not really. In fact, we've engaged the FDA recently on a tox finding that seems to be an AAV platform effect. And they have come back and said, we have to judge each product individually. So just because someone else has done it doesn't mean that you can get away with it, if you will, or springboard off of them. Now that's very different than a small molecule. Right, so with the small molecule where the mechanism of action has been well established, um, you can springboard off of some of their studies. I mean, that's where the 505B2 came for an NDA approval, right? You don't have to redo all your non-clinical studies again. You just have to do what's appropriate for your product. So that is a diversion um, in the OTAT or CBER um, center than what's applicable for small molecules. Okay, great. Um, Can I jump in with a, go ahead, sorry, Chad. Jump in with a quick question, and maybe I should say this for the, um, the broader discussion, but I just have to know it's a little burning for me to, to, to know this, this information. But I think a lot of times people, especially who aren't used to being in this preclinical development space, often look at the FDA as sort of like this boogeyman type of organization. Can you give us a little bit of perspective on how being sort of a former employee of of the FDA, how you view the things that are coming in or how you view your interactions with the, the scientists out there, either in academia or in industry. Say that again, from the FDA perspective, or like, I, I can wear both hats, right? So I've worked at the FDA and some of my friends say that now I've crossed into the dark side because I've worked in pharma as well. So right, depends on which friends. Um, so I can tell you when I was at the FDA, I worked in CDER. So drugs, so small molecules, monoclonals. 
our approach to all interactions with sponsors is that they actually made us, you know, when you go to meetings, if you've ever been to a meeting with FDA or health authority, it's them on one side of the table and the company on the other. They made us sit every other person to make it feel like it was an interactive, like we're here together as a think tank to try to get this product to the market to treat the indication, right? And that was my division. Many of the divisions still have some of that where you co-mingle to make it feel more collegial. Unfortunately for CBER, um, they're not so collegial these days. I think a lot of it is because they're just overburdened with the COVID interactions. Like we can't even get them on the phone right now. Everything's handled through email or, or uh, written responses. Um, really, they're not the boogeyman. It's how you present yourself, right? So if you, you need to respect them for what they bring, doesn't mean you have to agree with everything they say, and also doesn't mean everything they say is right, right? So the beauty of drug development is you know more about your product than they do. You're getting a snapshot of what you're giving them, say in your pre-IND book. And so it's up to you to either decide if you're going to take any or all of their advice at your pre-IND, or maybe you're not right? But you're going to address it some other way. So maybe they say you need to do another dog study to address it. And you say, no, I don't think I need to because I have this other data that is supportive. And the thing that's really interested, interesting to remember is FDA is data driven. So you got to give them data. You can't just say, well, I think it's not going to work. But they're also a whoa weight of evidence. So again, still based on data, but if you can pull different data from different sets of studies that you've can done to, conducted to say, I didn't do this exact study, but based on the weight of evidence, the totality of everything, I can present the story and get you the answer for which you're looking, but I didn't have, I didn't follow exactly what you said. So again, just because I say it doesn't mean it's black and white. It's up to you and your company or you to decide, am I willing to take the risk? Like I didn't, I don't have what they want, but I've got this. So build a story around this and show them the data and that weight of evidence that you have to address their concern. The worst thing you can do is not address their concern and stay silent on it. Because I can tell you when I used to get INDs, I would pull up the pre-IND feedback that I was involved in or maybe I wasn't, but the minutes are there to say, well, what did they ask? What did they say they're going to do? And what did we ask them to do? And did they do what we asked them? Also, as part of your IND, if you've had a pre-IND meeting, you have to say, this was the FDA feedback. How did I address it? And where's the answer? So you have to give them a reviewer guide to find, this was a feedback that we got. Did we address it or not? And if we didn't, Again, it's not a bad thing, but did you do something about it? Or maybe you said too early, not, not time to address it, or maybe we changed our clinical trial from the time of the pre-IND to the IND. That happens, right? So you just explain it. The worst thing you can do is to stay silent because they're gonna find it. <laughs> did I answer your question? Yes, it did, thank you. <laughs> All right, and I think where we are at time and given um, the topics we're discussing, it, it, the um, discussion is open to everyone. So Steve, feel free to jump in, Chad, jump in. Um, I'm gonna move us to the next question. Do we need to include recovery group for the small molecule talk studies? I'm, I'm gonna take a guess here and uh, if the questioner is still online, if you mean by recovery group, does that mean washout phase, if that's correct? I don't know, Steve or Suzanne, if you have question or an answer to that question specifically. I do not, Steve. Yeah, so generally for small molecules, you need to have a recovery group or groups. Um, and it is to your point, Ashley, it's a washout. So you're not treating them. So generally you can have, depend upon your PK of your product, maybe you start with a three month study. So you stop dosing everyone at three months and you sack them there, but then you'll have recovery animals that follow for usually about a month and you do the same assessments histopathological usually is what you're looking for to see if there's a reversal of toxicity. 
um, two species, usually. Uh, the, in the old days, it was a rodent, which was usually a, a rat, and it was mm -hmm. a dog. Mm -hmm. um, and the dog used to, or it could be non-human primate, used to have to be 10 to 12 month in duration. Now they've shortened that, that they found that going beyond six months, unless there's a, some weird toxicity that you need a long time to recover from, mm -hmm. is sufficient for your, your non two species study. So six months is usually where it ends. And then you might have a recovery group after that. Again, the discussion with the FDA on, do I have enough duration to support initially the first in human trial um, is what you need to have at the pre-IND. And then of course, as you get more patients involved and as you get longer treatment, if it's a repeat treatment, then you need to do those longer studies. Some companies do those longer studies up front. Some of them gate it. So they do just enough duration on the non-clinical studies to support your trial. Um, and then you add that on later. Yeah, and I, I, would, I would comment further on the recovery and washout experiments. I have seen programs firsthand where it, it really, the design of those studies can be, um, they end up, looking a little bit different if you do have tox findings. So, so different from if it's straightforward, no tox findings. And if you start to see tox findings, it, the questions really become, are they reversible tox findings? Once you wash out the drug, how monitorable are those in the clinic? Um, it's a little bit different for a dog or a primate versus what you can monitor in a human being at times. So making sure that it's reversible for one, for small molecules, once you wash out what the kinetics of that look like, and uh, then sometimes you might be pushed to move into a non-human primate if you started in dog. All right. Um, if we are not sharing the poll, let's go ahead and do that real quick. Have you ever taken part in the FDA, EMA, or other regulatory entity meeting or filing? So 40% of our participants today said yes, and 60% have not. So hopefully this is helpful for everyone. All right, I'm going to jump to our next question. The ICH guidelines do not really apply to oligo oligonucleotide treatments for ocular indications. Is there any possibility to meet with the FDA ahead of the pre-IND to discuss the preclinical toxicology strategy? Hmm. Yeah, well, there used to be the pre-pre-IND, uh, which is no longer. So now they call it the INTERACT meetings. I forget what INTERACT stands for. Initial, I have an uh, initial targeted engagement for regulatory advice on CBER products, because I was going to ask you about this, Suzanne. I think it's yeah. an important topic. So it's really CBER related. Um, CBER for biologics, gene therapies, vaccines, etc. cetera. Uh, in our experience, Interact doesn't pay off. So Interact meetings are kind of like a watered down version of a pre-IND. So you have to provide your questions and you still need to provide a briefing document. The difference is that you're not getting the reviewers, you're getting like a higher level like manager attend the meetings. The thing is that when we last spoke to FDA, maybe six or seven months ago before COVID, they had received something like a hundred plus interact requests and they had granted less than 20%. Hmm. Um, and so when we asked them, it was just an informal discussion, right? So I call up my friends at FDA all the time. So I'm like, so why? Like, why aren't you having meetings? And um, one was because they thought the company or the entity was too far along. That really an interact meeting should be much earlier. So maybe you're trying to figure out, do I have the right disease model? for this indication, that's when you should come to us, not have already conducted the study and say, hey, now what do you think, right? That's more for a pre-IND meeting. Uh, they tend to actually deny it to larger entities is what it seems. Um, so more mom and pop shops, really early startups that are trying to find their way, they tend to favor. And then the other, the third thing that they mentioned was that they hadn't thought about it enough. So get back to Steve's TPP. They didn't have a clear direction of where they were going, how they were going to get there. And so, you know, FDA is not a free consultant. 
they don't make that much money being a government yeah. servant. But, you know, so they're not there to be your consultant, cheap consultant. They're there to help you, but not to do the work that you need to do, right? So to Steve's point, a TPP can really help you not only figure out where you're going, but help the FDA help you get there. And maybe you're <laughs> on the right path and maybe you're on the wrong path. You know, you, you just don't know, but you need to think about. Do you even have bricks to make a path? Could you um, expand on that just a little bit uh, as far as people's expectations and in going into this meeting? Um, mm -hmm. You touched a little bit about they're not just free consultants. So what's, what type of detailed information should they give? So if I go to a pre-pre-IND meeting or just a general discussion, um, I assume that the FDA is not going to, even though I say if I want to do top studies, they're not going to tell me exactly which studies to do. I need to present them sort of my plan and then they can kind of have a, give you sort of a vision for maybe if you're going down the right or wrong path. Could you explain yeah. a little bit on that? That's exactly right. You can't just say, hey, what do I need to conduct? You have to go in and lay out your plan, like based on my therapeutic, based on the guidance, this is where I think, this is what I'm proven to propose to do. It's number of animals, duration, endpoints, et cetera. What do you think type of deal? Like, is it adequate? Because you have to say, is it adequate for what? Is it adequate to support your first in human trial? Is it adequate to address a tox finding perhaps? Say we have a tox finding and I've designed this really elaborate study. Will it meet the objectives to get to that answer? Um, they're not there to give you free advice. However, I, can, I would like to say that I don't always ask questions for information where I want to get their feedback. So like I said, you're better off being more open and transparent with your thinking, even though you don't have it fully baked as to where you're going to go and how you're going to get there. And if they have a knee jerk reaction to say you are off that yellow brick road, like you don't even have bricks now, they will tell you in the feedback to say, we know you didn't ask this question, but we saw in your briefing book on page 35, you know, they're very specific that you propose to do this. We don't think that that's the right approach. Be sure to consider A, B, C, D, E, right? So they're not gonna tell you definitively, like you're off the cliff, what are you thinking? But they're gonna direct you into, well, we kind of agree with this, but to make it better, make it look like this or consider this option. Have you considered this option? is when you're on the phone with them, that's usually what they say is, we didn't see in your document that you mentioned this. Have you considered this, right? Yeah, so just to pull Steve into this real quick, uh, from your point of view, getting FDA feedback on the TPP portion, what have you seen as the most common feedback or are there certain kind of categories that they normally react to? Um, I've had very little experience with FDA feedback, but I'm guessing, uh, based on what I have seen, that you're going to get feedback on things like how large your proposed patient population is. Uh, I mean, for the for the clinical studies, um, you know, what your dosing schedule looks like, um, what you know about off-target effects. Um, either on target uh, effects, but not on the right, target in the right uh, part of the body, uh, which happens, or off target effects that uh, are just due to the fact that the selectivity profile isn't high enough. Anything that, anything that affects a safety outcome, I think is where they're gonna be focusing based on what I've heard. Yeah, and I, I think to Suzanne's point, I think the best summary for how the FDA normally interacts, it's reactive. You lay out your strategy, you present the, you present the arguments and data behind it, but it's not, it, it, they're not generally giving advice where it's not asked or presented. Yeah. So Steve, I'm wondering, um, could you share some of the, a story or two about people who want to enter into this preclinical development lane um, but don't use a TPP, and they get pretty far along. Have you have you had experience with sort of advising or even maybe personal experience with 
why it's so important versus not using one and why you know my, my worry is that some people are listening on this uh during this webinar and they're kind of like uh you know that may be for others but i'm just going to go my own route and, and not really worry about the tpp you highlight some great reasons why to use it but can you give me any sort of just a story about you know maybe a a hard time somebody um went through because of them not using the tpp well, I, I I can think of one in particular, which is a, a an academic scholar who just didn't like to listen to advice, um, and got to the point where he thought he was ready to go to the FDA. And we had a team at Harrington sit down with him, and he was just missing all sorts of stuff. He hadn't taken our advice on what to do. He didn't have data that was going to uh, unequivocally show that is. Uh, molecule was interacting with the target. He said it was. Uh, we didn't have any, uh, we had a lot of useful things like PK, but we didn't have uh, anything related to potential toxicities um, outside of the organ of interest or, or um, uh, we just we just didn't have the right package of information because it's one thing to say, here's what we recommend you do. And it's another thing to come back to your next meeting several months later and find out uh, that wasn't what was most interesting or perhaps most publishable, which is another whole story we could talk about. Um, how do you do the things that are boring but critical to get the FDA to approve it, but not likely to increase your ability to publish the studies you've done, given that it's really important for academics to publish as it is for industry people to publish. So sometimes the things that get rewarded in academia are different than the things the FDA rewards and so it's a tug of war and without getting into specifics i think that's the biggest problem we face which is getting people to stick to the path that's going to get them into the clinic the fastest before their competitors rather than just doing the next experiment that sounds interesting and publishable or finding a balance between those two if that helps definitely thank you so combining a few questions that are coming through online, as well as a few that I think Chad and I had for the panelists. Um, actually, let me jump back real quick to the recovery period. And maybe this is for Steve. Um, how do you determine the duration of recovery period when we're looking at small molecules? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that's a little hard to say is, is to define by generalizations, I think it depends upon what it is you think may be tox. What kinds of toxicological events are you worried about? Are these long-term genotoxicity issues? Are these um, um, off-target effects of, say, uh, uh, a cancer molecule that may lead to um, serious problems in other organs than the organ you're trying to target with it? Uh, and And I think it's a you know, kind of kind of like watch and see sort of thing where you don't know up front how long it should be, but you can kind of give a guess at it. Plus there's a reasonableness issue. Um, if you're doing animal studies, they're expensive, long-term housing, long-term care, long-term monitoring. What if it only shows up in 10% of the mice after two years? Are you gonna do a two year study mm -hmm. with, you know, 10,000 mice? Uh, most people don't do that. So you do your best, I think, to come up with a period which you think any of the side effects or long-term toxicities that might happen would show up. Um, I think it's a case by case thing and Suzanne can comment on that as well. Yeah, yeah I think the, the pathology, what I've seen in the past is pathology really dictates the best guess at where you start those um, time periods of follow-up and, and it is a little bit of guesswork. So you, you try to guess at what the pathology is, um, what the pathophysiology affecting it is, and then you, you work backwards or forwards, however you want to look at it. Suzanne, I don't know if you have further comment. Yeah, no. I mean, the hardest part is if you're a new molecular first, you know, first in your class and there's nothing else yeah. approved, right? Because you don't have precedence. So you have to go with the data that you have on hand. But if there's a question after you open the IND, like you can submit questions to FDA. It can either be in the form of a type C meeting 
um, or it could just be uh, you can send a request to the FDA and say, hey, I have this question. Is there some mechanism to get the harm tax reviewer on the phone? Like in the old days, it was a little easier and they would say, hey, just send me your question. We might be able to provide a written response or once they get the question, they might say, oh, this is a little more involved. You know, we need more official documentation. Um, there's always the ability to engage the FDA. Again, they're not your free consultants or cheap consultants. Um, so you don't go to them with every question, but something that could really dictate the direction of your plan, your, either your clinical or your non-clinical or even your CMC plan, um, you, sh you should really consider engaging them. They aren't the boogeyman, as Chad said. Um, for the most part, I mean, hello, I used to work at FDA and I think I'm kind of normal, but you know, opinions vary. Um, we really are just people trying to do the job and our first objective is to ensure patient safety, right? And so if you look at it from that lens, that is what they have to do. And if they seem like they're not willing to move on an object, uh, a position, remember, probably 70% of the drugs that are in development never make it public. So, you know, you're, they're looking at products across the board from many different, and they have more information than possibly you do. Now, you know your product, but you don't know everything else they have on their plate that they've reviewed. So, you know, just because if they're becoming dogmatic about something, it's either because it's against regulations, which they have to uphold, or they know something from other products, right? So it's easy to be dismissive and like, ah, you don't know what you're talking about. But you have to go back and think about it. Maybe they know something you don't. Suzanne, is uh, Steve, is it, it must be the case that there are questions to which the FDA does not have an answer, except based on their experience in other programs where they may have seen something like the question being asked. And yep. to, to, to assume they know, you know, how long your recovery period should be for a new molecular entity that hits a target no one's ever hit before is probably asking too much. Um, yep. So you take your best stab at it and, and get comfortable yourself with the likelihood that you're not going to end up in a human population that starts to develop a serious disease a year after they're given the drug and you could have caught it. Uh, yep. But, right. but be reasonable in the cost and time and effort it's going to call, take to, to get the best answer you can. Uh, it's it's yep. not an exact science, I'm afraid. No, it's not. And you're right. They don't have all the answers. Um, but again, if you think of them as a think tank, we're here together to get this product and do your best shot on goal, right? Hit, hit as many shots as you can, back it up with data. You can't just say, oh, my gut feelings as this. They're data-driven or data-driven, depends on if you're the South or not. Um, so show them the data, right? It's like show them the money, show them the data so that they can make an assessment and be very clear on what your position is based on this data. And they'll either go, uh, yeah, no, or you know, you might be surprised, you might win. You, you know, there were some times where we had questions and we're like, oh, we can't possibly answer this. And then we looked at all this other data and we built a beautiful story. It was weight of evidence. We had data to support our position. They bought it. We were excited and surprised at the same time. So don't think it's insurmountable, but you have to, you have to do your work, right? You can't expect them to go look at all the journal articles that you have. If you're quoting an article, include it. Because if I have to go PubMed search for it, like I would go, Sheesh, why couldn't they just, you know, send me the article? Do what you can to make their job easier. And I do think there is an, a willingness to be innovative on the FDA's part and to rethink things. I, we see that in rare disease all the time. Trial design looks a little bit different, combining a phase one and two because of restricted population sizes. So I do think there's a willingness to listen and be open to new ideas. It, it may not become standard right away, but I do think putting those ideas forward and supporting it and justifying it, there's an openness to that. And I would just like to sort of build on that, especially for those who are working in more of, I guess, the emerging technology space. So if you're trying to create something that's never been seen before, 
Um, from my interactions with the FDA, it seems like they have a thirst for wanting to know what is sort of on the horizon that they that may become more mainstream. So, um, so it's, it's also a chance to educate those in our, our field about what's coming next, especially if you're on the leading edge of technology development. Yeah, remember, they're busy reviewing all your thousands of pages of submissions, right? So we, when you're there, you're in, you're in the data of whatever product you're reviewing at that time. So you don't have time to go look, hey, what's happening down the pike on this particular indication, right? So we have to learn through you. And then you learn literally on the job. You have an IND for some indication you've never heard before. So you have to do your own background. Um, you know, so again, make it easy for them. If they, we used to have our own seminars. We bring special people in, in that particular area, like blindness or some disease, to come and teach us about the, the indication because we didn't have time to do that continuous learning. Yeah. So, you know, also think of it that way is they don't, again, you know more about your indication and product than they probably do. So educate them. They don't know it all. Um, and just to draw everyone's attention to the Q&A portion, I think everyone can see this, but Suzanne's been multitasking and actually answering a few questions in there. Um, so who exactly at the FDA does one contact for a pre-IND meeting for biologics or gene therapy products? So she has posted an email address. What we'll do is try to open a resource list for this webinar afterwards, because there's a few things we've listed and, and we'll see if we can work on something to make these things accessible in the future or easy to find. Um, why don't we jump to another question? Have you ever seen an IND come back with little to no comments? Yeah, I think I answered that one in the thing, but unless I didn't hit answer. Oh, you, you may have. And I yeah, uh, the answer is yes. Never have questions, no. There's always at least one question and they're all usually focused on CMC, um, but always on clinical. Right. Yeah. You know, the other question I think I'd like Steve to answer is what qualities would you look for in a person who asks you to join their team to collaborate on drug development project? Like that is a, that's an interesting, I want to know, tell me. Well, that's a good one. <laughs> can I, can I preface this? Cause I was actually going to talk, going to ask you guys a few questions around just the process of putting, pulling together briefing packages and working on this process. Um, I think the gene therapy program, I, I used to work with Suzanne, full disclosure. So I've seen, I've seen how that machine works. It's a well-oiled machine, um, but not everybody has those resources at their disposal. So how do you go about putting all this together? Who, who's on your team? What does that look like? What is the time, length of time, resourcing, any help in that area? Well, that's a, that's a toughie. Um, it's not, <laughs> it, particularly you're asking who, if someone's asking you to join their team, now you're talking about a whole sort of like trying to figure out who to vote for for president. Um, but we won't go there. Uh, it, I mean, you obviously, you want to look for those qualities that I think say you're, you're A, you're being asked to help and you're gonna be part of a team, not just someone who's gonna have a lot of work dumped on them and not get any credit, right? So you're looking for that kind of leader and we've all had them um, either as mentors when we were working on our degrees or in our jobs, um, or even back when we were in uh, lower levels of school who were true mentors, wanted help. Uh, you, you worked for them after school or you worked for them um, as a graduate student uh, and you always felt they were looking out for you as well as the project, as well as themselves. What you don't want to do is, I think, work for somebody who has a big name, but is known to be a, and I knew them at the NIH, somebody who'd put two postdocs on the same project and see who won. Uh, so you're looking, for, you're looking for a good soul, an empathetic soul, and also someone who has enough experience in the field that you think your, your efforts are going to pay off in accelerating the rate of an interesting medicine getting to patients. So one, I'll, I'll just comment and kind of add to 
what I've seen working in both um, big pharma as well as uh, academic approaches and, and now at Odelia, we think of this as a, as a fuller effort. In the late stage preclinical space, there's aspects of it that are more prescriptive than early studies, early preclinical. Yes. Um, but it, it's complicated and it usually involves skill sets outside of uh, one individual or one group. You're usually engaging clinical expertise um, in the rare disease space, we always involve the patient voice and families as early in the process as we can, because it can become hugely important and influential on how the FDA views efficacy in that, in that space. Um, bringing in multiple experts from outside of even just the specific research group that you may be working with or maybe a part of can help broaden the view of, of what obstacles, risks that you might encounter um, Oftentimes we're very myopic in our research. And so looking, taking a more global view, stepping back and getting the viewpoint from others in the field can really, I think, change the direction more positively to be able to confront those early in a program. So you're not held up unnecessarily downstream. Um, so usually you're, what I would encourage groups to do is always build a, a broader team than yourself and really engage experts who have walked this line before, or if it's, it's a path that hasn't been laid identifying those folks who have the expertise to comment um, because they also become your voice at the FDA as well. They become important voices. All right. Yeah, and one other thing to add to that is that it's important to just delineate a KOL feedback versus a patient ad board feedback because a KOL is going to come at it from maybe what's most interesting to them, but it may not be what really is impactful for the disease or the caregiver or the patient themselves. And you know that's the hardest thing that in GTP and ODC, Orphan Disease Center, we, we have to always be uh, fully aware is what a KOL says as an endpoint is not what's meaningful for a caregiver of a child who's in a wheelchair. Right, yep. and then you also, you have to kind of tread that line and find that line, um, and also justify it to regulators, right? Because the, the clinicians say, "Well, that's not going to work in a clinical trial." And we're like, "But it has to work because that's what's important. That's going to be a quality of life impact, which is just as important as efficacy, right?" Yeah, um, so and Suzanne. That's for just to one. clarify, the, the KOL, KOLs are key opinion leaders um, for those who aren't as familiar with that acronym. Um, usually we're speaking about clinical KOLs, so clinicians that have experience in that disease and know the patient population. But you're absolutely right. Differentiating those two is hugely important, and it's come up in a number of rare disease programs. Um, oftentimes patient groups are becoming really sophisticated and engaged and proactive in this process. There's a there's a meeting process called the PFDD or patient focused drug discovery. And so it's for patient groups to engage the FDA early to, to Suzanne's point earlier, the FDA doesn't know all of these diseases, especially in the rare disease space. Sometimes there's not a lot commonly known. So these patient groups are going out seeking direct meetings with the FDA to, to educate the FDA and tell them about the disease, what matters, what day-to-day -day life looks like, what that looks like for the patient as well as the family around them. So I, I do think that's a really important point and why it's important to engage that voice early. All right, we have 10 minutes left. I want to pull forward another question real quick. Uh, we have a question from the audience. Is it easier to get an IND allowed as an academic applicant or a startup? So I think kind of pointedly getting to the question is, is there a difference in that application process and how it's viewed by the FDA, dependent upon where it's coming from. Eve, what do you think? I have my <laughs> being on both sides, all, all three sides, I guess, FDA, Big Pharma, and academia. I mean, if, if I had to personally guess, I would think, um, that there would be essentially no difference, that it's the science that's driving yeah. the FDA. Yeah, it's definitely about the okay. science and the data, but FDA seems to be more willing to grant meetings if it's coming from an academic than a startup 
Um, so, because they they almost seem like they're willing to be more helpful, right? Um, is what we've seen. It's interesting. Well, so yeah, I'll, I'll I'll jump in maybe just give and a question to our to our speakers as well. So I've noticed that at times, um, I, I lived a former life in working on uh, science projects for the Defense Department, and it seems that the Defense Department is very good at um, sort of softly lobbying the FDA to look at their issues first. So the thing I, I might mention is that while I think everything still needs to check all the, the boxes as far as safety and efficacy when you go to it, but it's essentially like, you know, who can get the meeting the, the fastest and get a reply? And I think often if you can partner with a government entity who has the, the, the established relationships within a particular agency like the FDA, it, it can only help. Um, and just sort of doing a, a lot of the, the, uh, the, the DC maneuvering. Um, it's always good to build strong, strong relationships and advocate for yourself and um, get others on your team that also can advocate for you. That's not to say that the quality of your work can be any less, but it, it, can, it can maybe help, you know, the process a little bit. Completely agree. All right, a few more questions in here. Um, any big differences between the FDA, EMA, and MHRA, just to name a few, so regulatory bodies. I think, Suzanne, you touched on a few of those with uh, species, so maybe you can comment on just a few strategic thoughts. Yeah, so we always go U.S. and ex-U.S. for all of our programs, um, because when you're, when you're developing a program, say gene therapy, at least right now, uh, you're going to, and even small molecules actually, is you're going to want to comply with the most stringent requirements from a health authority, right? So if FDA has the highest bar that you must overcome, but say EMA is not as high, you're probably going to do your development to meet the FDA standards because you know the other standards will be met because FDA has the most stringent. What we found for gene therapy is that it really depends on the country as to whether they're gene therapy friendly or not. Uh, EMA wants to know a lot about the ATMPs, as they call it, advanced therapeutic medicinal products. They want to know more. They have special committees that you can uh, get in front of. MHRA is very friendly to gene therapy. I mean, look at the Oxford um, AZ product with an a advirus, like, or a vaccine, like, that's crazy, right? Well, not crazy, but cool. Uh, but uh, UK is very friendly um, and they're very collegial. EMA will grant meetings, but they're very specific. Like when you go for scientific advice for EMA, um, you have to go with your marketing authorization in mind. They don't tell you if you have enough to start a first in human. So it's very different approach to, um, when you go to them. Italy's friendly, Netherlands friendly, Australia's friendly, Canada, I'll let you know in two weeks, we're going for our first Health Canada interaction. Um, so really it, you know, and in rare disease where I'm currently working in gene therapy, rare disease, you have to go where the patients are, right? Because we're many times ultra rare. And so um, you have to be creative with the countries that you go. Um, so. I don't know if that helps, but there are differences. We find FDA have a much higher bar. EMA's kind of in between and MHRA just loves you. They just like, yeah, come on, do some studies here. It's great. Um, so. Germany's like FDA, always have been. We used to submit INDs to FDA and CTA's clinical trial applications to Germany and daggone, it was like they had a bat phone we get the same feedback from FDA as we would from Germany, B Farm, right? So it's it's really interesting. <laughs> um, jumping, we're we're down to the last five or six minutes here. Um, jumping back to process and just having available resources to get this done. If you're a group that doesn't have that machinery at your disposal. Um, I guess what does it have you engaged consultants? Um, in the process and it has that work does that make sense when should you consider that because there's a lot of groups out there that, out there that that do this for a living and can help you uh, 
Well, I mean, I think the answer to that is yes. I think there are a lot of um, ex-pharma people who've lived in the regulatory interface space or ex-regulatory people um, who are now out on their own trying to help provide advice. I don't know who they are and how to pick the best ones, but I bet it wouldn't take much work on the internet to figure that out. Um, I think having someone who's been through this before multiple times and has had experience interacting with the agency and putting together Hey, Steve, I think we lost you. Yep. Oh, maybe we're having some technical difficulties. All right. Suzanne, any comments from your yeah, side? We're, we're finding that there are some CROs that have actually gone out and recruited ex FDAers from CEDAR and CBER quite heavily. And there are a couple companies that have just ex FDAers, period, that have come together and put their companies together. Um, I'm not saying that FDAers are the way to go, but they'll give you kind of like the inside track. Yeah. But there are other people that have led a lot of companies help them down the pathway. And that's just as important as having an ex FDA or on your side is that sometimes it's not about the inside track. It's more about the pathway and can they help you find the pathway that may not be what you envisioned and may not hit every stone that you may need to, but to help you think outside the box to get you there. Um, where I found the companies that have ex FDA on board is when we get a clinical hold letter and we've reviewed it and they can help us re read between the lines. Like what we're finding is the feedback we're getting is not as black and white as what's on the page. You have to weirdly like dissect every word that they've used in the response. And that's where we have found them, at least those that have come out of the agency recently within the last year or two, uh, very helpful because the way we interpreted the response for the whole or the comment about the hold was not how they interpret it. They're like, well, wait, they use this word. This is what this really means. So it helped us position the response better. Um, so I guess in short, not that I don't love my, my government um, friends, but they are helpful, but they may not be helpful on getting you there because they are not responsible for drug development when you're at the FDA, you're responsible for safety and reviewing what's put in front of you, right? So they may not have thought about all the development that needs to get there, like someone else, for example. Right. All right, uh, let's throw this one out to the panel real quick. How much approximately does a phase one gene therapy clinical trial cost? I've seen estimates that range from a million per patient and they're giving uh, this, this person specifically, for example, 15 patients. I've seen those range from 5 million up to a million per patient. Anyone else? It's your initial cost. Remember that you have to do your long-term rollover follow-up. Yeah, that's true. And depending upon the product, like we, we just recently priced out minimal five-year follow-up, just phone calls, like not even um, you know, going in and having assessments done. And I think just it was 10 patients, and I think just the follow up was 2 million, and that was just for a phone call. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, and you still have safety reporting, right? So, I, I think the what was estimated there is, is about right, but it's really not that much different. I mean, you're doing a carcinogenicity study in two animals, two years. I think they're $2 million each just for rats. Humans better than the rat. Just saying. <laughs> All right. I think we are basically out of time. I hope we got to most of the questions on the Q and A. Um, if not, maybe we can try to follow up those later. Or please feel free to reach out to FFB or Odelia if you uh, if you like to have a further chat. If you have any feedback on the webinar today or other topics you'd love to see us engage experts on, please feel free to reach out. And with that, I want to thank Steve and Suzanne. Really appreciate your time and everyone for joining us. Appreciate it. All right. Stay tuned for webinar number two. Uh, we will post details soon. All right. Thank you. Take care. The pleasure. Bye. Bye.